Hey, what's up everybody? Today we are reacting to a news article that has been taking the internet by storm. And research that surprises almost nobody, we are having a lot of validation for teachers, professors around the country who have been saying that using AI to write your papers to do your homework is probably not great for learning results. And while that finding probably doesn't surprise anybody, the details about how it really affects our neurology and how our brain functions is pretty fascinating. So we're going to be diving into that today and talking about how AI specifically affects people who are writing essays and how that affects our learning outcomes and learning processes. So we'll dive into the overview of the article from USA Today specifically, as well as looking at the specific paper and some of the findings that they've got. I'm not a neurologist by trade. These are MIT researchers, and so I don't pretend to understand all of the implications, but I do want to highlight a couple of things that I found very fascinating and I think are applicable to all of us who are parents, all of us who are teachers, or people who just want to learn and really better understand how AI might affect our brains, how our use or maybe our dependence on AI when it comes to learning and completing academic tasks or any other kinds of tasks may be adversely affecting us. So please do like and subscribe, help us to grow the channel and continue to create content like this. Let's dive into this article. So the opening from the article says that artificial intelligence chatbots may be able to write a quick essay, but a new study from MIT found that their use comes at a cognitive cost. I don't think this finding particularly surprises anybody. MIT was conducting this research to really specify what the costs might be when it comes to relying too much on ChatGPT, which was the specific AI model that they used. I think ideally you're talking about wanting a research study for its results to have a lot more power. You would be trying to look at a larger population, but there are some reasons that logistically it probably just wasn't feasible. So MIT analyzed the cognitive function of 54 people writing an essay with these following conditions, okay? So there was one group that only used ChatGPT, another group used only online browsers, so searches like Google, this is the era that I grew up in, and then another group had no outside tools at all, so they called this the only brain power group. And so they were monitoring the brain activity during every group writing the essays, so they were able to compare the results of the neurological function and the cognitive activity of people in these different conditions, whether they were using ChatGPT exclusively, whether they were using search browsers exclusively, or only their brains. So each participant had 20 minutes to write an essay from one of three prompts taken from SAT tests. So right away, this is like a nightmare scenario for people signing up to do this study. I would never want to write SAT essays again, but these people did it. Props to them, they survived that study. And they actually repeated the trial for multiple conditions, so they were writing multiple SAT essays. So this is the interesting part. All of the essays were judged by two English teachers and two AI judges trained by the researchers. So you had your human component and you had your AI-generated judges. So important to this study, the English teachers were not informed which essays were written by which conditions. So they didn't know whether someone used only their brains, whether they only used search engines, or whether they only used ChatGPT. But what was interesting was that the English teachers were able to accurately identify which essays were written by ChatGPT, and we'll dive into that particular finding later on, but what they said basically to sum it up was that the creativity was lacking and that AI actually has a distinctive writing style that they could pick up on, and so they were able to consistently identify which ones were written by AI. So one thing I found that was actually pretty funny about the article is that the AI judges that were trained by the researchers to evaluate, like the real teachers, scored each of the essays, that means including the ChatGPT essays that it wrote itself basically, gave every essay either a four or above out of a scale of five. So it seems to like its own writing. So let's dive into some of the results and then we'll dig into some of the discussion around that found in the article itself. So when it came to the brain activity, the researchers probably unsurprisingly found that the strongest widest ranging brain activity belong to those who only use their brain. But in contrast, those who use ChatGPT displayed 55% reduced brain activity. So on the surface, just as an overview, right? Very fascinating study, really important in terms of understanding how AI is affecting our students and those who rely on it for tasks such as writing essays, especially as an opportunity for students to learn, to creatively use language to communicate effectively and develop their own voice. There are definitely a lot of concerns that this study brings up in all of those regards. So let's dive into some of those concerns that the researchers found. So one of the questions that researchers asked the participants after they wrote the essay was to quote themselves, basically 
give me a quote from your essay that you just wrote. What they wrote is, in the LLM learning language model, so AI assisted group, 83.3% of participants, 15 out of 18, failed to provide a correct quotation. This is of the essay that they wrote, whereas only two out of 18, 11%, in both the search engine and brain only groups encountered the same difficulty. And a follow-up question, the AI model users significantly underperformed in terms of being able to quote, with 83% of participants reporting difficulty quoting their own work and none of them providing correct quotations. So if you're talking about using essays as a way to learn, as a way to incorporate ideas into your own mind, as a method of learning and of study, then this is definitely a problem because using AI really led to a lot of the participants not being able to consolidate these ideas for themselves, being that they weren't able to quote their own essays correctly. And as you see, this wasn't a problem for the people who had the other conditions, whether using a search engine or just using their own brains. Another interesting aspect was talking about ownership of the essay. Now this may seem like an offhand kind of question that doesn't seem very related, but it does really matter when it comes to memory and encoding if we're talking about essays as a vehicle for learning and for study. The brain-only group claimed full ownership of their text almost unanimously, 16 out of 18, and in a follow-up session, 17 out of 18 participants. I don't know why some people wouldn't claim ownership if you were the only one that wrote the essay and there wasn't any Google involved, there wasn't any AI involved, but whatever. The LLM group, the Learning Language Model AI group, presented a fragmented and conflicted sense of authorship. Some participants claimed full ownership, which teachers and professors definitely have a problem with. Others explicitly denied it and many assigned partial credit to themselves. And so that kind of fragmentation in terms of the ownership of the essay does mean something when it comes to learning. So if you don't feel agency and ownership over something that you are studying or learning, I've seen this in a lot of clients, you don't tend to care as much about the content that you are working on and studying. And where this takes it a step further is that the researcher said that a diminished sense of cognitive agency from a neural standpoint aligns with reduced convergence on anterior frontal regions, which again, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a brain scientist, and so that by itself doesn't mean anything to me. So what they explain, this region, the anterior frontal regions, are involved in error monitoring and self-evaluation. So these are really important for students, for anyone to have, especially when it comes to our written output, to be able to have a sense of ownership to monitor if there are mistakes being made, if I'm not quoting correctly, if I'm not analyzing correctly, as well as for self-evaluation, being able to look at my work fairly and honestly and to be able to evaluate seeing whether I've created good work or not. And so we get to the most interesting point made in the USA Today article that there's 55% reduced brain activity when you use AI to write an essay compared to just writing it using your own brain. So let's discuss what that really means and how the researchers interpret that. So they said when discussing this, the brain only group engaged in more large scale integrative processes at slow frequency, possibly reflecting deeper encoding of context and ongoing integration of nonverbal memory and emotional content into their writing. So that you're incorporating muscle memory as well as emotional work into your content as opposed to the AI model group that was not incorporating that to the same extent. Tools free writing activated a broad spectrum of brain networks from slow to fast rhythms, indicating a holistic cognitive workload, memory search, idea generation, language formulation, and continuous self-monitoring were all in play and coordinated by frontal executive regions. All right, so let me break that down a little bit. When we talk about using AI memory search, you're using the AI's memory as it were, so you're not diving into your own memory. You are not generating your own ideas. That's what a lot of people use AI for, is to generate ideas for them. And so that creative process is stunted when you're using AI. Language formulation, well, if you have the AI writing your sentences for you, then all you're doing is kind of cutting and pasting, maybe editing here and there, so there's no formulation of your own original work. And continuous self-monitoring, you're not self-monitoring, you're actually monitoring the AI. All of these tasks that were present for the brain-only group 
based on the description by the researchers, would most likely not be present if you were using AI. So this is what they wrote. The LLM assisted writing group elicited a generally lower connectivity profile, so less parts working together in the brain. While the LLM group certainly engaged brain networks to write, the presence of a LLM appears to have attenuated the intensity and scope of neural communication. The significantly lower frontal theta connectivity, again, disclaimer, I don't know what that means, in the AI group possibly indicates that their working memory and executive demands were lighter. And we would expect that because you are not relying on your own memory, you're relying on whatever ChatGPT provides for you. It's collective memory, if you will, as well as the executive demands. You're not choosing to generate and create sentences and then decide what to write. You're taking what it provides you and deciding whether that's what you're going to use or not. Again, presumably because the bot provided external cognitive support. Essentially, some of the human thinking and planning was offloaded and the brain did not need to synchronize as extensively to maintain the writing plan. And this is definitely a concern for students that we're talking about in today's day and age. The AI group's reduced beta connectivity possibly indicated a somewhat lesser degree of sustained concentration and arousal aligning with the potential lower effort during writing. And so this is what a lot of my clients will struggle with, not even the ones specifically diagnosed with ADHD, but students in general, lower degree of sustained concentration and arousal, potentially lower effort during assignments. And this is a lot of students right now. And if we are going to continue integrating AI into classrooms and things like that, or even if they continue to use it outside of the scope of what their teachers or professors have recommended or allowed, you are creating more of a problem for yourself as a student by leaning into these tendencies that require less concentration, less ownership, and less original thinking. So let's get into how these essays were actually judged. Like I said before, ChatGPT was very generous as the AI judge and it gave everyone at least a four out of five on their essay. The human teachers were a little less generous in their grading. So they evaluated the essays based on different metrics like uniqueness, which again, we would expect to be a problem when it came to AI generated work, vocabulary, grammar, organization, content, length, and chat GPT, which was whether they thought the essay was written by a bot or by a human. So this is what the teachers, this is what the human evaluators had to say about the essays that they read. Some essays across all topics stood out because of a close to perfect use of language and structure while simultaneously failing to give personal insights or clear statements. Guess what essays they're talking about, right? Perfect construction, perfect use of the language, which we would expect from a language learning model, but a lack of personal flavor, personal touch, a personal voice, what we're trying to develop when it comes to essay writing. So these often lengthy essays included standard ideas, reoccurring typical formulations and statements, which made the use of AI in the writing process rather obvious. This is just an aside to the students. Next time you think that your teachers can't pick up on the fact that you're using AI to write, apparently it's pretty obvious and maybe they just don't have the time to care about it, which, that is a separate issue, but let's just say don't fool yourselves into thinking you're outsmarting the system. So they said that they perceive these essays as soulless in a way, as many sentences were empty with regard to content and essays lacked personal nuances. While the essays sounded academic and often developed a topic more in depth than others, we valued individuality and creativity over objective perfection. This is reflected in lower content and uniqueness scores while language structure and accuracy are rated higher. However, some of these obviously AI-generated essays did offer unique approaches, e.g. examples or quotes, which then led to higher uniqueness scores, even if structure and language lacked uniqueness. So what that says is, ChatGPT has a writing style. And what my concern for that is, is basically that a lot of the native creativity of these students or these participants in the research are being robbed or taken out of the equation. When we rely too much on ChatGPT, we lose a lot of the human element of our communication, which being a therapist really matters to me. A lot of times I'm not listening just for the specific content of what someone is telling me in their story, but also the emotion behind it, the insight, the humanity of it. And so there's something definitely lost when it comes to relying on ChatGPT for a communication. So we might make an argument that, you know, this is one off, you know, if you just use it for school, it doesn't have to affect the rest of your communication. But I go back to, again, with a small sample size, but I go back to 
when we're talking about the connectivity across brain tasks and if you're not engaging that fully when you're writing essays for school or doing assignments for school then you start developing habits in one way or another and especially when we're talking about adolescents who are very vulnerable have a very plastic mind in the sense that it is growing and developing and becoming entrenched in the patterns that you use for it this is a problem because if we have students over relying on ChatGPT to write their essays, they are under utilizing, under exercising, if you will, their creative regions, their executive function, their self monitoring, their ability to check for errors in themselves, less invested, less sense of ownership in their learning and their work. All of these are problems that in one essay may not be an issue but repeated over multiple assignments, multiple years of school, develops character, work habits, and other character traits in probably a negative way. So where does that leave us? I don't think there's going to be a lot of legislation coming in about ChatGPT and how it's used academically. And I don't think that schools are gonna be able to legislate it out of their systems because as we see in this research, it leads to lighter cognitive load when you use it, which means Basically, it's easier to use rather than generating an entire essay by yourself. I can attest to this. We had to practice basically that exact thing in middle school and high school multiple times and people hated it. Give in a prompt, 20 minutes, write an essay. It's challenging. So this is where it relates to mental health though when it comes to anxiety, ADHD, other things that impact learning and relationships. If we are always doing the easy thing we don't challenge ourselves and we are more likely to shy away from challenges in the future and that doesn't set up anyone for success. And so I definitely encourage my clients to face challenges. Take challenge for yourself in a safe environment. And honestly, if you're in middle or high school, the opportunity to take a difficult challenge of an assignment like writing an essay within 20 minutes is probably the safest type of challenge you can have. Like, yes, you might fail, but if you're in middle and high school, you can recover from that. And if you develop that ability to take on challenges, to use a lot of that executive function, that creativity to inject your voice into your writing, that's an invaluable thing to gain while posing minimal risk. And so I really do value this study. I think it's really cool how they designed it and the tasks that they put people through and the studies and follow-up questions that they did, as well as assessing the language, the brain activity and then bringing in teachers to evaluate. I would hope in the future, again, logistically, this would be difficult, but having a larger study, maybe long-term study from students who have used AI from like middle school on all through college versus those who have not, I think that would be fascinating to be able to follow a student's brain development through that adolescent period. But again, resources, time involved, that might not happen. Overall, just fascinating to think about and really provides a lot of context to what I'm seeing with students who struggle with some of these academic tasks right now, who shy away from difficult tasks, who procrastinate, who are anxious about those things, because there's an easier option available and they've oftentimes trained themselves to always take that easier option. So this isn't to dunk on AI. I think it'd be valuable, used effectively and in some places, but again, that over-reliance on it. These are brain scans of people who have done one essay and then they did some follow-up essays this is not over a long period of time and you can already see some of the differences in brain function because of that. And so I hope this is a warning for us as we explore AI more, especially in the mental health and learning and academic fields. But yeah, let me know in the comments below, what do you think about this study? What would you like to see more about? What questions do you have about it? And what's your opinion on it overall? So thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you all next time.